This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. Also, make sure to check out and subscribe to our YouTube original channel, UCTV Prime, available only on YouTube. talking today about um, an evidence-based practice, um, self-management systems and self-regulation skills. And I think it's always good to sort of start to reflect on our own behavior. We all deal with a lot of stress at various times in, in our day and in our lives. And we all have strategies for regulating and self-managing um, a lot of our stress. Some things are healthy and other things maybe are not quite so healthy. Um, the fact of the matter is that we all have self-regulation tools and strategies. Uh, and in neurotypical individuals, they develop along a continuum, um, starting with behaviors, actions, things that we do. And when you think about your top three strategies that you identified, uh, how many of you had things that you physically do to help manage your, um, your stress to regulate? Exercise is an example of a behavioral strategy. It's something we physically do with our bodies. Deep breathing is another good example. I'm doing some of that right now <laughs> to try to manage the stress. Um, how many of you had language strategies, talking to other people, um, venting, uh, maybe getting advice on how to deal with a stressor? Um, that's a, a, the next level that typically emerges. Uh, and then how many of you use internal metacognitive strategies, a, a, a meditation that you use, or some self-talk, maybe some justification for um, why the stress is happening, some internal problem solving? That's the highest level of, of regulation and um, one that most of us as neurotypical adults um, use quite regularly, especially when we can't say what's actually in our thought bubble or on our minds. So these are all strategies that we have. And for individuals who have difficulty with self-regulation and self-management, oftentimes they get stuck. Maybe they get stuck at a behavioral le level, doing things to try to manage their stress, their, their anxiety, their frustration. And maybe those behaviors aren't necessarily appropriate to whatever the context is that they're in. Maybe they use language, but again, maybe not appropriate language um, for the, the given context. And then, of course, that metacognitive, that higher level thinking-based strategy. We know a lot of students, particularly those on the autism spectrum, have a difficult time with that internal dialogue and using problem solving and using those good executive functioning skills to figure out how to handle certain situations. So. Um, it's, it's important that we recognize that not all people develop it with the same capacities as, as we might have, and that things do happen along a developmental continuum. We're going to talk to you today about a variety of different strategies, behavioral strategies, language strategies, and even some that may lead into that highest level of, of metacognition or thinking strategies that can help not only individuals who are affected by autism. We're going to show you some strategies for uh, individuals with ADD, ADHD, um, and emotional disabilities and, and um, who qualify under the ED category. Um, we hope to provide you with things that you can take away, but also some resources that you guys can make use of after today's presentation. Uh, and we wanted to, to really provide you with some um, examples of students across um, the age range um, of K-12 education as well as um, various disabilities. So you can see how this strategy works. So as, uh, as interesting as self-management and self-regulation is to to talk about uh, the actual implementation of uh, these systems uh, is not uh, as easy. Uh, but fortunately, what we do have is a system. So if you um, 
look at how do you try to regulate your own behavior when you shared those systems with your partner, reflecting on how did you learn those? Did anyone teach you those? Or did they develop out of uh, pure chance? Things like that. When we think about our kids, for instance, in a home setting, community setting, or a school setting, how do we want them to behave? Oftentimes in a school setting, for instance, it's a stressful uh, environment. Sometimes we ask kids with disabilities, for instance, to walk into a classroom. It's a square box, uh, but for some of these kids, it's a little torture chamber. And so we're asking them to cope with a tremendous amount of stress and anxiety. How do we do that? Well, for those of us in education, um, trying uh, to teach them self-regulation by repeatedly telling them to knock it off or stop it or um, quit acting like that. Uh, if you try that strategy uh, and it's not successful the first 57 times that you try it, it's highly unlikely that the 215th time that you tell the kid to knock it off or uh, straighten up or stop blurting out is going to be effective. So the question is as much how do we uh, learn to self-regulate as it is how do we teach a kid to self-regulate. And like I said, the good news is that there is a system to do this. And this system can be found online at the NPDC's website. And we're going to be going over practical systems uh, to give you an idea of what that really looks like in practice. Uh, but all of these systems require practice, repetition, direct instruction. And those are things that uh, teachers are really good at and uh, that parents uh, can learn to do as well, learn to teach their kids. So basically speaking, um, here are a couple steps that we're gonna, you're going to find common in a lot of the systems that we're going over. Uh, first of all, you need, the learner needs to be able to identify when they're engaging in a behavior and when they're not engaging in a behavior. And so this may seem very simple. Uh, is the child engaging in self-stimulatory behavior during a lesson? Are they talking to themselves? Are they repetitively, uh, re repetitively engaging in a physical behavior like tearing paper or twiddling a toy or something like that? Um, other kids uh, with maybe ADHD, are they attending? Are they on task? Are they not on task? So while when we're calm, cool, and collected, it's very easy to discriminate between these behaviors. When you're in the moment, it's not so easy. And it's easy to look at the kid and say, well, you know, how come you can't uh, self-identify or self-monitor when you're doing these things or you're not doing these things? But again, I think it's very important to, uh, before we point the finger at the kid, to pick up the mirror and look at our own behavior. You know, do we really recognize when we're upset uh, or when we are starting to um, become flustered or anxious before it's too late? Are we that good at catching ourselves doing things in social situations like not listening to the person that we're talking to or um, perseverating on our own topics of interest, so on and so forth? So this is a very important piece. Can we get a kid uh, or an individual with um, all sorts of disabilities to identify. Am I engaging this behavior? Yes or no. If you can't get them to distinguish between engaging in the behavior and not engaging in the behavior, then it's going to be very difficult to move on from there. Um, once we have them uh, with a certain success rate of identifying the behavior and the non-behavior, then we need to make sure they can self-record. Am I doing it? Am I not doing it? We see self-recording, self-monitoring, self-recording, self-management systems in all sorts of areas in our lives like diet programs or exercise programs. Those are good examples of where we monitor our own behaviors. And then uh, a behaviorist is going to argue that all learning um, is integrally tied to motivation. So where is the motivation to try to control yourself? Some kids may see the motivation. I want to be a better friend. I want to learn how to make friends. So I'm motivated to invite people to play with me or expand my conversation repertoire. Um, but if there isn't that motivation, like, you know, blurting out is easy. And yes, I get reprimanded, but I also get a lot of attention. So why should I 
control that behavior. We may need to put something on the table to increase motivation for that student or for that learner to increase their um, participation with a system like this. And we'll be going over that more. Um, so what are the benefits of self-management systems? Well, uh, they can increase independence. Uh, you're really shifting from an adult constantly telling the kid what to do, and that can be effective. I mean, we do that all the time. But where's the longevity in a system like that? If we're really looking at getting a, a child ready for transition into adulthood, uh, where's the, the independence in the system? And teaching kids how to manage themselves, manage systems that help them manage themselves is a step in the right direction. Uh, if we design these systems thoughtfully, they can be used across environments. Uh, and so the, the student or the child can learn how to manage their behaviors across um, different settings, community, home, school. And they, again, if they're thoughtfully uh, designed, can be relatively unobtrusive. Um, it also allows the student to participate in their own intervention. We will ask students to help design these uh, systems so that they're fun, incorporates their interests, are manageable, and things that they're interested in, in doing. If we're asking a kid to modify their own behavior in an environment, and they're in high school, for instance, uh, we may not want to make that such a public event, uh, because then it might be more punishing than it is motivating. And it can minimize power struggles. Again, if the adult is constantly telling a kid what to do, what not to do, you're doing it again, stop it, uh, that can deteriorate the relationship between the adult and the kid. And once the kid starts hating the adult, uh, it's very difficult to teach a kid that doesn't like you. And um, as uh, Dr. Abaduda was talking about, there has now been some real solid consensus in the autism world anyway around what is evidence-based practices. What are, the, what are the strategies we should be using that are most likely to be beneficial for kids uh, with ASD? And these are the findings, uh, or a matrix of the findings of the NPDC on what is evidence-based for kids with autism. And we have 24 EBPs here, the acronym for evidence-based practices. And you'll see that uh, self-management is right down here by the arrow. And the other interesting thing, I think, about self-management when you look at this matrix is it's one of the, if not the only, uh, evidence-based practice that's been found to be effective across academic, cognitive, behavior, communication, play, social, and transition domains, and across uh, the age spans, so elementary, middle school, and high school. So a lot of effective, uh, a lot of research supporting the effectiveness of self-management systems with kids on the spectrum and young adults. And this is just highlighting that point. So what do we, what do we use self-management systems to do? Well, the, the point that uh, you're going to see today when we, when we look at these systems actually in application, it's not all about getting kids to stop doing annoying things or, or reducing problem behaviors. That is one of the points, that, those, that's one of the goals or objectives uh, of self-management systems, but we also use them to increase good behaviors social skills, conversation skills, participation, uh, self-regulation, so on and so forth. Um, these self-management systems can be used to promote learning and independence, work production, delayed gratification, all sorts of skills that are essential to independent functioning uh, across the age spans. And if we had uh, short little quiz questions throughout this presentation, um, just to see if people are uh, thinking about this stuff. Which self-regulation strategy would be the least appropriate on the playground or in the workplace? So if someone's really annoying you and your blood pressure starts increasing, your anxiety starts increasing, your blood is boiling, um, should we be uh, you know, removing ourselves from the situation, going for a walk, smacking someone for revenge, or maybe going to talk to another person? Any ideas? Probably we wouldn't want to be doing C. So we're going to be looking at the essential steps that we need to take in order to utilize a self-management system. 
one of the first things our students need to be able to do is cue into the signal. And throughout our presentation, we will give a variety of examples of signals that can be utilized. Some are more discreet than others. And initially, you may have to use a more overt signal with a student in order to teach them to cue into it. The student has to be able to determine, am I on task or off task? Am I engaging in an on-target behavior or off-target behavior? Then the student self-records that behavior. And throughout our presentation, we will give you a variety of examples how that can be done. And then the student returns to that activity, and at a, once a criteria is met, they're able to exchange their sheet for a reinforcer. The ultimate goal is for a student to be able to manage their own reinforcement system, but initially they may need some support through that. Part of teaching self-regulation skills is teaching a student to wait. And waiting is a foundational skill in teaching self-management strategies. And we used a visual to teach expected and unexpected behaviors to a student in kindergarten named Nate. We were looking at identifying expected behaviors as following teacher's directions, doing my work, and quiet mouth and body. Unexpected behaviors were identified as not following teacher's directions, not doing my work, and talking to self or others. We specifically chose these behaviors as they were area of deficit. We had Nate's input in developing the visual. He got to choose what pictures would go with each of the behaviors. So he had great buy-in as we were going through the process. We explained the visual to Nate, and then we role-played behaviors in each category. We specifically had Nate practice the expected behaviors and the adults practice the unexpected behaviors, as we did not want to give him additional opportunities to practice unexpected behaviors. So let's take a look at Nate discussing his expected and unexpected behaviors. Nate, what are some expected behaviors? Uh, follow teacher's directions, uh, uh, do your, do, I, uh, do my work, mm -hmm. and listen, uh, be a quiet body, and quiet body, hands and feet. Nice job. Okay, what are some unexpected behaviors? Not listening to the teacher, not doing my work, and, and talking to myself or others. Nice job. As you can see, he's quite familiar with his visual and definitely knows what are expected and unexpected behaviors. Currently, what we do with Nate is the staff sets a timer on an intermittent schedule, and Nate is learning to cue into that timer, and then on his visual, he marks whether he was engaging in an expected behavior or an unexpected behavior. Let's take a look at Nate using his system. Nate, was that expected behavior or unexpected behavior? Expected. As you can see, he's still learning to cue into that timer, so we had to provide a little prompt to say, okay, time to check your visual. And as you can see, he's He's, starting, he's learning his be, the expected and unexpected behaviors, and he was able to stay on task for the duration of the activity. Next year, our hope is to be able to fade to a less intrusive timer by having him wear something like a watch that we'll be discussing later that will vibrate, and it will be a little bit more discreet in the classroom setting. So one of the other um, components of self-management is being able to identify emotion and to be able to learn strategies for responding appropriately to emotional states. And this can be really tricky for kids um, uh, who maybe aren't even able to cue into certain internal states like thirst or hunger. 
Um, but teaching them how to identify their emotion in context when they're actually experiencing it really leads to self-monitoring and um, self-regulation of those emotions. So this is a, a visual tool um, created to um, basically give um, a visual representation to emotion. And you get student buy-in with this because they're able to identify a color that reflects that emotion. They can draw the character in that color, or they can use this as a palette um, to identify a color that goes with that emotion. The next step is whenever you see them experiencing that state, or when you're experiencing it, pointing it out in context, because we want them to pair the label with the actual internal experience of that emotion. This is um, the self-management system that we used with my friend Brayden, um, who I'm gonna show you in just a minute, actually doing a self-check after um, the first hour of his morning at school. Um, we started by teaching him how to label his emotions, um, including happy, angry, sad, scared, and then of course purple, proud. Um, we then took the, the little um, symbols that represented those emotions and um, taught him how to label um, how he was feeling during certain times of his day. The other component that we paired with this um, was a social story or a social narrative um, that talked about how to respond to different emotional states. You know, the fact of the matter is there's gonna be things that happen that make you angry or that make you scared or that make you frustrated, but there are appropriate ways of being able to deal with that when you're in the classroom and less appropriate ways. Um, so we taught him how to identify and make those appropriate choices. In this video, you're gonna see um, Brayden doing a little self-check um, at the end of the first hour of his school day. He's got his self-monitoring chart and his social narrative sitting on the table with him. Um, and the teacher is asking him just to check the three behaviors that he's self-monitoring and indicate how he did that morning. I had nice hands. I had calm. I had a, a quiet and calm voice. Good job, buddy. And I... I said where I was staying. I stayed. I stayed where I was supposed to supposed to be. Very nice. You did, buddy. You had a wonderful morning. The great thing about most kids that um, that are on the autism spectrum is they're brutally honest. And so he was really accurate at self-monitoring how he'd done. If he had angry hands or um, went out of the area he was supposed to be in because he was frustrated, he was usually pretty honest about it. So he was relieved that he got through that morning part of his day. Um, how many of you guys are familiar with or have ever used the incredible five-point scale? Um, this system is absolutely amazing and um, a, a really great way to teach kids not only to identify their emotions or emotional states, but I kind of think of it as um, teaching kids to identify um, that, that gray area or that escalation period of time. Um, most of, of the kids that, that we work with that have problems with emotional regulation and where this is a challenge, um, I kind of think of them like a light switch that has an on switch or an off switch. They're either really, really frustrated or they're really calm and doing all right. And what we want to teach them is the idea of a dimmer switch that you know, your, your frustration or your anxiety or your anger um, gradually increases most of the time. Uh, and when you catch it when it's at its lower levels, um, then that's really the time that you can redirect your behavior or you can make a choice um, that might be appropriate for that context. So the incredible five-point scale is a method for doing that. It's visual, so it works really well for a lot of, of students who don't respond quite as well to a lot of auditory input. And it gives us a tool to be able to reference um, at appropriate times. Here are a couple of examples um, of the five-point scale. Um, looks like, feels like, and what I can do that helps when I'm at these various levels. Here's another example. Again, looks like, feels like, and what I can do when I'm at these levels. 
And you know, when, when we're dealing with kids who have these very quick escalations or difficulty identifying where they're at um, in terms of, of their emotional state, you know, the best times to intervene are when they're at a two or a three. And for some kids, maybe at a four, they can still be coached, they can still be redirected, um, they can still be shown this visual in order to, to make a, a better choice or a better response. Um, and the idea here with the five point scale is that you really don't ever want to get to a five. A five is when bad things happen. A five is when people get hurt. A five is when you say things that you can't take back. A five is, quite frankly, when you get older, it's probably an illegal behavior. <laughs> Um, so teaching them how to identify those lower levels, the twos and the threes, and then having a visual for the choices that can be made, it's really an effective way to help students begin to be able to regulate those behaviors and those emotional states. So real quickly, little quiz question, a little check-in. Give you a second to read that. Devin's teacher created a self-management system to help Devin decrease his blurting out behaviors. She left the self-management system on his desk with a note reading, if you want to earn more time with your favorite computer games, then please start using this self-management system. Which of the following steps did the teacher forget? <laughs> and, and really mostly, and, and the point of this question is, these skills have to be taught. And telling someone isn't teaching them. Um, teaching them means that you provide opportunities for practice, you provide prompting, you provide reinforcement. Just because we've done a great job developing a self-management system doesn't necessarily mean that the student's going to know how to use it or that they're going to value it right away. It's something that we have to be really um, mindful of and, and really careful in terms of our planning. Um, how many of you guys have ever created a chore chart for your kids at home, for example? and it sits on the refrigerator, doesn't get used. Same idea. It, creating it is, is part of the process, but the teaching of the system, the reminding, the making it part of a routine, an established part of the routine is, is really critical and very important. So there are some wonderful tools that are available um, in terms of um, supporting self-management. Um, technology has lent itself very nicely to the implementation of these strategies. Um, one of the, the tools that I use very frequently, in fact, you're going to see me using it with my son um, for homework time uh, on the next video, is an app for the iPhone, iPad, iPod. I don't know that they have it yet for Android or any of the other um, um, uh, phones or, or uh, PDAs, but um, this is an app developed um, to basically help with self-management and to help with um, reinforcement. And what I like about it is, number one, it automatically resets itself. So with a traditional kind of timer, someone has to s reset the timer. This one automatically resets after every interval. The other thing is, um, it's on a variable schedule. So if I set it, say for example, for three minutes, it might go off at two, one interval. On the next interval, it might be three and a half. On the next interval, it might be exactly three. So any of you who know about intermittent reinforcement know that this is a really powerful way to maintain appropriate behavior because you never know. You never know exactly when that timer's gonna go off. Um, so this is a great tool for being able to, um, to work on self-management. Another version, very similar idea, is the WatchMinder. And this is a wristwatch that's programmable um, that can either have a, an auditory signal or it can vibrate. So for kids who want things to be a little bit more discreet, um, like my son, um, who doesn't want people to know that he needs to use tools to help him with on-task behavior, this can be a, a really good um, um, strategy to use. Um, you can set it, again, for intervals of time, and when that time elapses, a, a short tone or a vibration will happen on the wrist. A um, couple things about the WatchMinder, what I've found personally is um, kids get desensitized to it, um, so it's not something that can be used all day, every day. You have to be really cognizant of, of when you're going to use it. I've found that about every three days, um, it, my son can wear it and it will help him to actually um, 
self-check and, and is on task behavior improves. But more frequently than that, and it's kind of like anything, you, you know, you sort of forget that it's there and it loses its effect. So this is the most handsome guy on earth. This is my son, Owen. Um, and he's challenged with attention deficit disorder. Um, and the, the biggest impact for him is his ability to stay focused. Um, how many of you guys have kids you work with where this is a major factor? Um, he also gets frustrated when he's redirected. Um, he wants to be able to do well. He wants to be able to complete his work, but his brain just goes off track. Um, so we taught him using the R Plus Reminder app um, to monitor his own behavior. And in this video, you're going to see him completing homework. Um, and I've got a, another evidence-based practice going on with the bins. He's got a, a to-do bin, which is the white bin, and a finished bin, which is the black bin. So all of his work that he needs to complete goes in that white bin. And when he finishes it, he moves it over into um, the, the finished bin or the black bin. Um, so here is Owen using a self-management system with the R plus reminder um, signaling him when he needs to check. So he was playing with the erasers in his pencil box rather than doing the work when the timer went off that time. And there's the self-monitoring system he's using. It's a T-chart, on task, off task, and he just puts a tally mark on the side that corresponds at the interval um, as to how he was doing. And the R Plus Reminder app, I have it there on the iPad. So I'm doing a system during this video um, of monitoring um, the accuracy of his self-recording. And that's an important component of self-monitoring. Um, you want to make sure that the, the student or the learner is accurately identifying whether they were on or off. So uh, that requires that, that you check in every once in a while to make sure that what they recorded is what you recorded and that those answers match. Um, this system for my son um, has helped him with on-task behavior, with task completion, and in fact now, whenever he's really struggling, he'll call me into the room, he'll say, Mom, I need that timer thing. <laughs> so he's advocating for the, the tools and the strategies that he needs, which is it's really ideal because, you know, ADD, ADHD, autism, you know, neurobiological differences, we can do a lot to help improve the skills, but to teach the self-advocacy and to teach the kids to recognize and value the strategies that work well for them, um, I'm feeling really good about that, so. So I was struggling to get some buy-in with one of my students for a system. And one of the things that really helped is I created, his name is Carter, so I created Carter Bucks. And essentially what I did is I took his picture and put it on a $100 bill. And he thinks that's just the coolest thing in the world. He loves seeing his face on money. And since then, he has just bought into my system. And the way it's set up currently is we set a timer for 25 minutes. So 25 minutes of work equals 100 Carter Bucks. He's able to collect his money and then at a later point exchange it for a variety of items or activities such as computer time. Currently we are using a timer and I hope in the next year to be able to fade and start using a watch minder watch like Patty was discussing earlier. So let's take a look at Carter using his system. So I've got your timer set for 24 minutes. So when your 24 minute timer goes off, you get 100 Carter bucks and then you get your computer time. Sound good? Okay. Don't look at the words. All right, so your spelling test number is 29. And I like how you put your holes on the left side of your paper. That's very good for fourth grade practice. Okay. 
Wait a second. Let's take a look at a quiz. So Allison is using her R Plus Reminder app to help her stay on task during language art class. Each time her phone vibrates, she self-records whether or not she's on task using a simple data sheet. Her goal is to be on task six out of 10 phone checks for three consecutive classes. Did she make her goal? I'll give you a few minutes to take a look at her data. As you can see, on the first day, she was able to meet six out of her seven checks and she was on task. The sec second day, she was on task for seven out of her, six, seven out of her 10 phone checks. The third day, she was on task for six out of 10 phone checks. So she did indeed meet her goal. With any system, our goal is to promote independence. Initially, we may have to provide more support for our students as they're learning the system and we want to ensure that they are using it appropriately. But our goal is to fade adult support. Even once a student is independent, we do want to do checks to make sure that they are using the system appropriately and accurately. Over time, as they gain independence, we can increase the expectation that is required to gain access to their reinforcer. I'm gonna show you a video of another one of my students, Antonio. He's learning to manage his own system. What the teacher does is, during math worksheets, at the end of each row, she makes a dot. When Antonio is completing his work, when he gets to that dot at the end of each row, he makes a check on his token board, which he's self-managing. We've also incorporated a first then um, first end strategy on his token board so he knows what he earns once he completes the assignment. Did they use the same numbers? Yes. Antonio, what? can you tell me about those dots? What happens in this paper? What? When you reach the dot, you make a check. Mm -hmm. And then what? And then you have free time. Awesome. Yay, did you get all, how many check marks did you get? Five. So what do you get now? Free time. Yay, thank you. So as you can see, he's very comfortable with the system. The wonderful thing is we were able to fade the system and have a dot at the end of every second row, then every third row, and he's actually at a point where just a dot at the end of the page, he knows he's done with that activity and he's allowed to have access to his reinforcer. One of the uh, other things I uh, spend a lot of time doing, uh, consulting with school districts, is work on program development for students who have been identified as emotionally disturbed. And this is a population that's growing very fast uh, with that educational identification in our public school systems. And traditionally, um, in California anyway, when there was tons of money, uh, these kids would be identified, school districts would try to handle them as best as they could in-house, and when that didn't work, they would send them to non-public schools. And now um, there's no more, no more money, and school districts are trying to find ways to support these students 
in-house once again, uh, but they are finding that the level of support required is pretty intense and it has to be very pre-planned and thoughtful uh, and take into consideration just so many unique aspects of this population. And the ED population uh, is a lot different in some ways than the ASD population. However, um, there are some overlaps, especially when we consider comorbidity and the fact that a lot of uh, children and individuals with autism have other diagnoses. And I'll get to that in a second. Uh, but when we build programs to support students uh, who have been identified as emotionally disturbed, uh, we're looking at um, programs that really increase their ability to independently participate in uh, academic educational settings on a public school campus, decrease behaviors that are interfering with their ability to do so, self-regulate their emotions, uh, and we are building comprehensive treatment programs for these students in some schools, some school districts. So when we look at um, how do we, you know, define this population, uh, it's, it's not necessarily a clinical diagnosis, it's an umbrella identification category used by the public school system, uh, but underneath that umbrella we're looking at some fairly serious uh, diagnoses, anxiety disorders, bipolar, conduct disorders, eating disorders, OCD, psychotic disorders. And when we consider, just to link this into autism, when we look at uh, the autism diagnosis in individuals with autism, we see comorbidity with all sorts of other disorders, uh, and this, some of those can be from this list. But again, on the left, these are the conditions, but the way they manifest themselves uh, is what's so problematic. Uh, hyperactivity, aggression, withdrawal, immaturity, learning difficulties, uh, these are the things that the students struggle with that we see as educators and parents, uh, and they will affect the child's ability to integrate and be successful and independent. So I just want to go over a couple uh, small practical strategies that, uh, just to give you a flavor of how we, how we are supporting kids in a classroom as far as managing their behaviors. Um, and one of my favorites, just because I know it drives teachers crazy, uh, is the blurting out. And how many of you uh, who are educators have struggled with a student in your classroom who just cannot control their impulsivity and the constant calling out while you're trying to deliver your masterpiece curriculum? <laughs> that nobody's d struggled with that? Okay, a couple people. Um, so I see this all the time, and it's very frustrating, and the response that I see from teachers often, which is a very traditional approach, uh, is the stop it strategy. Stop blurting out, stop blurting out, stop blurting out, and then maybe you really up the intensity of your intervention and you call the kid in uh, after class and then really have a conversation as to why they should stop blurting out. But again, if that's not working for you um, or for the student, then coming up with a different system so that the kid's more likely to have some success. Whenever we have a problem behavior like that in the classroom, um, when possible, try to flip it um, and look for a positive behavior to focus on that if the student is motivated to perform, it will be impossible for them to uh, engage in the problem behavior. So we could tackle blurting out and try to reduce, reduce blurting out behavior during a 50 minute lesson. But another op uh, option is to set up a system where we're going to try to target appropriate participation. And in a well-designed classroom with good classroom management systems, what should appropriate participation always begin with in a classroom? So show me. There, some of you have learned that, right. Raise your hand, okay. So if we can motivate a student to raise their hand and then wait to be called on, and then participate and vocalize, verbalize, whatever they're, whatever's on their mind. Sometimes it's appropriate, sometimes it's not, but let's at least just start with some level of control with the hand raising. 
I've done everything from set up little tiny systems like this with a paper clip or a check mark. I've also tried to show teachers how easy it can be by simply just walking in, taking a ribbon of paper, ripping, ripping it into four pieces, putting it on the child's desk, and then talking to them about what does appropriate participation look like, what does blurting out look like. We've got a 50 minute lesson coming up. How many times do you think you can raise your hand before you blurt out during this 50 minute lesson? And why would you think, what would be the motivation sometimes for many students to blurt out constantly during a class? What do you think they're after? What? Attention, okay. If it is attention, then sometimes what I'll put on the table for a kid is uh, a joke. And I'll say, look, I've got a couple jokes here, or I've got a joke book. If you can um, appropriately participate four times in the next 50 minutes, the teacher's gonna let you come up at the end of class and treat the whole class to an age-appropriate joke. So you wanna make sure you script the joke. They don't let the kid come up with it. Um, and then you strategically seat the kid in the front of the class, or at least do spot checks or drive-bys, and if the child remembers to raise their hand, wait to be called on, and participates, you can either help show them how to slide one piece of paper from the left side of their desk to the right side of their desk. You can give them a thumbs up or a signal of some sort that shows them to slide a piece of paper from the left to the right, and then you have a goal. And if they reach that goal, they then get to deliver the joke. Uh, this is powerful because blurting out does feed the student with a certain level of attention. And if we were to you know, make a joke that attention is like a drug for some kids, then maybe that's you know, five cc's of attention. There's a blurt out and a reprimand from the teacher or all the kids looking at the, kid, uh, at the student. But kids will wait and they will attempt to self-regulate if they feel or they understand that they may be able to cash in on 20 cc's of attention by actually getting up in front of the entire class and telling a joke. And the interesting thing when I've done this with kids is that it's very practical, easy to implement, and at least in the beginning, uh, you can see a huge shift in the kid's behavior. In the first time that they try it, in the first 50 minute class that you implement this. Um, the other interesting thing though is that you will see a kid white knuckling that 50 minutes. It's not necessarily an easy thing. It's not as if the kid just turns it off. And I will see kids wringing their hands. I will see stress on their face. But the way I interpret that is that the child has now been motivated with a system to practice self-control. And they're going to practice self-control for 50 minutes. Let's give them another 300 opportunities to do that over the course of a year, and maybe we will start seeing some long-term behavior change. What, what happens, though, also is that these systems will lose their motivation. Getting up in front of the class and telling a joke is very motivating the first 20 times you get to do it, but it will lose its shiny you know, um, uh, motivation and incentive over time. And so what do we need to do to stay ahead of the curve? Rotate the incentive. So it's a joke a couple times, it's, it's a show and tell another time, it's being able to share something with the teacher in between classes, so on and so forth. But sometimes self-management systems can be that simple. In the comprehensive ED programs that um, that we're developing or that people have developed, um, when you look at the ones that are based on the research and what works, you almost always, or I feel pretty safe in saying, you always want a component that is established and taught from day one to the entire class if you're looking at a comprehensive restrictive um, classroom for kids identified with ED, for instance. But I would say this works for autism as well. Uh, what is the protocol in the classroom for emotional escal escalation? Okay, so this is one of the problems with ED is that 
things will set them off. If they get disappointed or they get frustrated um, or upset, you know, every kid gets disappointed, frustrated, or upset. But what we see in the ED population is their emotional response is far beyond what we would see from a pouting little girl who didn't get her way. And she's like, hmm. The child identified with ED will throw things, scream, use profanity, run out of the classroom, so on and so forth. So what's the protocol in those classrooms to promote self-regulation? And one of the biggest problems we see with programs that are set up inadequately is that there is no protocol. Um, just talking to the kid, stop doing that. You know, that's not appropriate here. If you do that again, you're going to get punished. Uh, but a, a huge step in the right direction is to set up a positive protocol. You could combine something with the five point scale, for instance, as Patty was describing. But, um, Another protocol that I've seen uh, implemented um, by a therapist that I work with as part of a multidisciplinary team in a local district here, she will take a puzzle like this that she can just, she just downloads off of Google, blank puzzle, um, print out the image, and then we'll talk to the kid about drawing something on this puzzle that's either motivating to the kid or reminds them of calm or an image that will make them think of you know, self-regulation, so on and so forth. The kid colors this in. And then the protocol is uh, if you start escalating or if we see you climb from a one to a two to a three, then I may give you a nonverbal reminder. I might point to the puzzle. I might um, try to help you remember what your choice is until they start making the appropriate choice. And then if they request to take space, that's a very common term used, then they will ask to take space and there will be a protocol for that. There will be an area in the classroom, they can go outside, they can go into an adjacent classroom, whatever the protocol is. If they make that choice to self-regulate versus dumping their desk, throwing things and having a ma major meltdown, then a puzzle piece will be delivered to them and as they build their puzzle uh, and complete their puzzle, then incentive or reward will be delivered. And so we're just trying to uh, provide a positive choice for a child to practice an appropriate way to self-regulate um, using a visual. And as I just started to mention, um, I work uh, with a multidisciplinary team in Elk Grove Unified, and we've been working together for several years now building, compre building capacity and comprehensive treatment programs for kids identified with ED from first grade to uh, till high, through high school. And one of the things that is an integral piece of these programs is a comprehensive behavior model based on a level system, but a lot of their movement toward incentive, toward uh, independence and so forth, is really dictated around a self-monitoring system, where students are asked to self-monitor their behavior across these domains. Arrival, compliance, appropriate social behavior, on task behavior, and then possibly an individual goal that's directly tied to a behavior support plan if they have one in their file, which most of them do. What we do is then anchor each one of these uh, very clearly to a definition, a specific observable definition of what that looks like. So arrival, uh, a three would be sitting in your seat, ready to learn before the bell rings. A two is you're in the classroom before the bell rings. A one is you're just coming into class after the bell rings. And a zero is not coming to class or extremely tardy. We ask kids to self-monitor and self-record every period of the day, and it starts to build a culture within the classroom. Their ability to accurately self-record is usually the first hurdle that teachers have to deal with, is are they accurately recording? Because the higher their scores, the more incentive, the more independence, so on and so forth. And that takes time to teach, like any self-monitoring system. The nice thing about situations like this, though, um, or developing systems like this, 
is that it increases expect the clarity of expectations, which I don't think any teacher would argue against or any parent would argue against. It's just how do you develop that for a population that has high needs? Um, this significantly minimizes power struggles. Teachers don't have to get into huge, drawn-out conversations as to did the student follow the expectations, did they not, what did it look like, is there any negotiation or bartering. It helps teachers stay out of that because they can just point to the system, follow the system. It's very clear uh, to everybody involved. Now, it takes time to teach, um, and it can take months to teach. It can take years to teach. It depends on the kid. but. Developing systems like this, not just in one classroom, but, in, but across an entire district, uh, we know that kids who are identified as ED, it's not that they're identified with those disabilities for one year. It usually follows them from year to year to year. So we're trying to set up a continuum of service that the child can rely on uh, throughout their time in a school district and hopefully phase out and then return to general education. So these are just some ideas or um, uh, how that self-monitoring system is scored and, and anchored. So it goes back to what is the appropriate behavior, what is the inappropriate behavior, and can they distinguish those two? Then those systems are built into an incentive um, program. And as we look at self-monitoring systems, uh, one of the steps in developing a self-management system is incentive, it is reward. Why should I? What's the point? And so we have these level systems set up for these kids. And so Monopoly, here's a football system. The students decide, this is high school, so that's a, it's a casino um, system. <laughs> Wasn't my choice, but uh, the kids are highly motivated by it. Um, and how they self-monitor and self-manage directly relates to where they get put on their system. So I just want to show you a quick video of an elementary school teacher going over uh, a self-management system with one of her students. Okay, Jerry, so I'm going to go over your points, okay? Um, Matt, this morning you did an awesome job. Like, I didn't have to ask you to get started. You just, you were helpful to your peers when they had a question, so you earned all your points um, for following directions and getting along with others. You did an excellent job. Um, and then during the fire drill, uh, you, you earned your points doing your work in your area. Um, and communicating appropriately, but um, for following directions, um, remember when Miss Caitlin had to ask you to stay in line and you're kind of uh, not following directions right away. So um, you did have some effort though, um, so I give you a one for that. Um, do you agree with that? Mm -hmm. Okay. And then. Um, so this is the initial step of you know going over with the kid, and this goes on every day, every week. So it's just this constant descri description and problem solving and also positive reinforcement around a student's choices related to that system. And then at some point, um, these students have the opportunity to use what they've earned. Okay, I'm looking for somebody that's sitting quietly at their desks, Jeremiah. Come on down. Okay. Did you do your job today? Yeah. Okay, six, seven fifty. Is your desk clean? Mm, yeah. Looks pretty clean. Okay, that's eight fifty, nine fifty. Did you do just one job or did you do two? I did one. You did one? Okay, so that's eight fifty. And um, did you have a perfect day today? Yeah. Yeah, you did. So nine fifty, buddy. Good job. Okay, so overall you've got fourteen seventy-five to spend in the store. And so then we have uh, stores set up where kids can exchange these things for tangibles, privileges, so on and so forth. The interesting thing with these systems is that at the beginning of the year, the incentives within the store are highly motivating. It's what gets our initial buy-in. But with the teachers that manage these systems and their relationships with the kids and teach them how to manage, teach the kids how to manage their, the systems themselves, uh, the store is faded out. And the kids are motivated 
uh, through the self-management system uh, as well as their relationship with the teacher. And so here's another video um, of the exact same thing going on with a high school student. I'm just going to show you the first 10 seconds of this. Um, oops. And then pass it over to Patty. All right, guys. And now this student's self-monitoring himself and being checked at the end. And then later he goes in and man manages that with the teacher. So we've described and, and shown you a lot of different ways to teach students how to self-record or self-monitor um, their behaviors. And um, self-monitoring um, is, is part of um, evidence-based practices in general, but it's also been called and, and considered a pivotal response. Um, because when you learn how to self-monitor your own behavior, your behavior generally changes in the direction that you want it to, even without a whole lot of other interventions being in place. How many of you guys have ever um, done any kind of behavior change on yourself where you've self-monitored and recorded? Maybe it's your calorie consumption, an exercise log, um, the number of cigarettes that you've smoked, or anything like that. That's, that's the idea of self-monitoring. Being able to identify whether you're engaging in or doing the behavior or not doing the behavior is the, the prerequisite. And then doing it honestly, because it doesn't do any good to fudge on your calorie count um, when your long-term goal is to be able to, to decrease it um, or to lose weight. So um, the next and, and final strategy that we wanted to talk to you about really starts to get at that more cognitive side of self-management and self-regulation. Um, and that's the ability to really self-reflect um, on behaviors and choices and um, to plan for and think about the goals and outcomes that we want to see um, out of our behavior. And you know the problem, quite frankly, for a lot of the, the students that struggle with emotional regulation and behavioral regulation is they're reacting. They're reacting to the world around them without really stopping to think about the possibilities that might result from their behavior. Um, a lot of this is organic in nature. That prefrontal functioning hasn't quite emerged in the same way as it does with, with other kids. Um, so they get in this sort of state of situations happen that cause their actions and outcomes happen that cause their actions. Um, in other words, it would be like, well, the teacher gave me the assignment and then the teacher gave me the bad grade. So they think everything happens to them without really seeing the reality of it, which is situations happen and we have actions. And those actions then have outcomes. And the sequence goes this way. Um, so this graphic organizer um, is, is a tool for being able to start to help uh, people understand this relationship between situations, actions, and outcomes. And I'll tell you, when I first started um, using this particular graphic organizer, um, I was working as a behavior analyst. And of course, when do behavior analysts get called in? when kids are being really naughty, right? And there's a behavior problem happening that, um, that needs to be changed. And so my initial um, use of this tool was really looking at actions or behavior problems that my students that I was called in on were demonstrating and helping them understand the relationship between their problematic behaviors and the consequences, uh, punishments basically, that were happening as a result. Um, and then, of course, the ideal is for them to, to start to see this relationship and come up with a different action that would result in a different outcome. And you know what? It worked. This basic self-reflection um, works for, for, for students who struggle with organizational thinking and being able to, to kind of look at that relationship. But here's the problem. These kids get called out on their bad behavior all the time. What if we use this tool instead, proactively, and in a positive way, to get them to reflect on positive behavior? Do you think you'd get more buy-in from your students if you approached it in that way first? 
Absolutely. They're not going to associate this graphic organizer with bad behavior and screwing up once again. They're going to associate it with making choices and doing good things. So the way that I introduce this to, um, to students now is by having them reflect on a positive outcome that's happened and what the actions were that led to that outcome. So it might be something like a good grade on a test and they define or identify what they did in order to earn that grade and what the context or situation was that set them up to maybe do the studying for that exam. Now, it takes a while, um, and it takes, again, teaching, not just telling, but teaching, for kids to start to get the hang of this and start to be able to, to see that their actions and what they do impacts the outcomes and the positive or negative things that, that happen as a result. It's a lot easier for kids to learn to self-reflect on past actions before trying to predict and control and plan for future actions. So doing it as a self-reflection or a reflective tool first, um, you'll get a lot more mileage out of it. The next component of this um, graphic organizer for self-management and self-regulation is um, to start to get them to think about choices. So you take a positive situation, something that they did, say studying for a test and getting a good grade, and then you ask them a hypothetical, what if? and oftentimes drawing a new square right below the original square, what if rather than those actions, what if you would have done this? What if you would have not studied, um, played Xbox all night, blown it off, come to class unprepared? What do you think the outcome would be? Now you're starting to get them to do something really challenging for a lot of our kids, and that's to, to make some predictions about what might happen in a current uh, context or situation. Okay. This takes a little while, but once kids start to get it, then they start to get it. Now, I always start with really obvious things, um, a real big discrimination between something positive and something that's probably not a good choice. But there's that word, the word choice. If you are stuck in this mode of thinking and mode of operating, what does choice really mean? Things happen to me all the time. I'm a victim of circumstances. How many of you guys equate a lot of the kids and, and the types of things that we've talked about, those kids are, are constantly in, in victim mode. Everything happens to me. And we use that word all the time, choice. Well, you just didn't make a good choice. You need to make better choices. But what is choice if you're constantly just reacting and responding and aren't able to connect actions with outcomes? So teaching them this and then getting them to discriminate between what they did that had a good outcome and something else that might not have a good outcome starts to actually teach that concept of choice, which is incredibly empowering. When kids start to see that they do have some influence on the things that happen to them, they start to really become empowered. And that's critical for self-regulation and self-management. So here's the example that I was talking about. Um, and when I use this strategy, um, and, and I'd encourage you all to, to give it a try, even in your general education classrooms with your typical kids at home, um, with your friends and colleagues and neighbors, because they could probably benefit from some of this also, I call it a pat on the back. You know, reflect on something positive that's happened. Give yourself a pat on the back for something that you've done. Um, and then introduce choice making. Because the ultimate outcome is to get kids to the point where they start to think about the long-term outcomes of their actions and behaviors, to start to set goals and then develop plans for obtaining those goals, and reflecting on their actions in a way that tells them whether or not they're making progress towards that goal or not. Okay? A goal is an outcome that we want to have happen in the future. And we have some influence over whether or not we achieve those goals by what we do now, by our actions and our behaviors, um, both now and, and in the future, um, on trek to that goal. So this is a really great way to be able to do that. 
And I have one final video that I wanted to show you. Um, and this is a, a youngster you're going to see actually um, reflecting on his goal. Um, in this classroom, a fourth grade classroom in a Title I program improvement school, um, the, the fourth grade teacher um, had all of the students give themselves daily pats on the back. And he had all of the students set goals for themselves. Not students with disabilities necessarily, although there were a couple identified um, in his class, um, but all of the students to be able to start developing that um, empowerment and, and help them to be able to see that they do have some influence over their outcomes. Um, and the video that you're going to see is this young man reflecting on his goal. Now, what I will say to you, he's not a young man with a disability, but a young man significantly at risk. And after you watch the video, we'll talk about why and how using this tool helped to head off um, some, a path that a lot of our, our kids at this age level go through when they start to experience academic failures. My circle, um, last trimester I was behind in reading. I was at a bad reading level, so I had to try to get it up. In my square, I had to do my solution, and I tried and tried and tried, and I did better on the reading test, and I got a high score. Can, can I ask you, when you tried and tried and tried, what did you actually do besides trying? Did you read more books, yeah. longer time? What, read what? At home. You read at home? A lot more. A lot more? Did you read more books? Yeah. Did you take more AR tests? Yeah. So you had some things that you actually physically did, right? Yeah. Okay. And yeah. what about your triangle? In my goal, I have, I have achieved it, and I'm in my read my old reading group again, my big one. Okay, so are you, you're in a... Mr. Lyle's reading group. Okay, so you got to move up, and your reading score now is, uh, as I understand, above grade level, is that right? To like 3.5 to 5.5. Okay, 3.5 to 5.5. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing. So he went as a fourth grader from a 3.5, which had him moved into an intervention group, to a 5.5, which is above grade level, um, because of three actions. He read at home, he took more AR tests, and he, and he, and he basically just practiced more. He read more. Okay? Um, what I think is really pertinent about this video, when he said, I just tried and tried and tried and tried. If he was pairing trying with an actual behavior versus not pairing it with something he did, you know, you can try and try and try and try and try. I mean, I can try to fly. It's not going to happen. You know, there's things that you actually have to do. And so getting him to reflect on his behaviors, his actions, and making a plan for how he was going to improve and meet that goal really was what it was all about. Okay. Now, I'm sure that, that you guys all know lots of, of kids like this. Fourth grade, academic demands start to get a little tougher. You know, if there's any kind of, of low area on that bell curve in terms of, of performance, maybe reading, spelling, writing, whatever it is, um, this is a, a real at-risk time for a lot of our kids because when they start to experience failure and they don't understand why and they're trying and trying and trying as hard as they can, we tend to see kids that, that really start to lose interest in school, becomes harder to motivate them, to get them there, um, and to, to really support them in, in accomplishing their goals and doing as well as they can. So um, teaching him how to reflect on his behavior and set goals and plan for his goals using a, a visual format was really um, powerful for him and really powerful for a lot of kids who struggle um, in the area of, of self-regulation and goal orienting. So. Um, this brings us uh, pretty much to the end of our time with you. I did want to point out that in the syllabus, um, we did provide you with an implementation checklist um, for self-management strategies. Um, if you were in Dr. Abadudo's talk this morning, he talked about the MPDC project. And um, one of the, the things, I think probably the most valuable tools that the MPDC um, has developed are um, these implementation tools so that practitioners have some guidelines 
um, that they could take away and use to know how to implement these evidence-based practices. So the implementation checklists are there. Um, there's also um, internet modules, training modules um, on all of those 24 practices that we showed you um, that you can access, including self-management. So if you want more information, you want to see more video examples, um, and, and or take the strategy back to share with your colleagues. Um, that's a great resource for you. I've got the websites um, up there. The top one is the MPDC site itself. And the bottom one are the autism internet modules um, that have the, the training videos and, and training um, units on each of the EVPs. The UC Davis Mind Institute was created in 1998 with a promise to find cures for neurodevelopmental disorders. Every day, our physicians and researchers come closer to fulfilling that promise. Their groundbreaking research on autism, fragile X syndrome, chromosome 22Q11.2 deletion syndrome, ADHD, and other brain disorders are helping children achieve their fullest potential. Please visit our website to find out more about current studies, upcoming events, and how you can help make a difference.